Okay, that's great. Oh, I just got a notice that recording was in progress. Okay, that's good. And um, so uh, let me uh, just see if I can advance. I got to click a few buttons here. Um, so uh, this uh, talk is um, uh, about a project that I, I took on um, actually as a result of an approach from somebody at Elsevier to write a review paper on terrains in the Iapetus Ocean for, uh, initially it was Gondwana research, but I managed to persuade them that it could go in a science reviews. So it's now way overdue. Um, so hopefully something will be submitted very soon. Uh, but this is a progress report on a collaboration between the list of um, uh, people that you see here in no particular order. Um, I do, however, want to mention uh, my two uh, summer students, uh, not from this from the previous summer, from 2020, uh, the summer when we couldn't do field work at all, and I had already taken on two uh, NSERC USRA summer students, Daniels Kononovs and Jordan Cope, uh, now graduate students at the University of Alberta. Um, but uh, we took on, uh, as you will see, aggregating and summarizing a vast amount of stratigraphic and particularly the trifle zircon data. And um, this uh, could not have been done uh, without their help in that, uh, in that task. Um, the other thing that's in the background of this project for me is uh, back in 2014, we published a, a, a paper entitled, How Was the Iapetus Ocean Infected with Subduction? And in which we address the question of how a widening ocean, the Iapetus Ocean, um, suddenly started narrowing again rather early in its history um, and suggested this Caribbean-like model for how subduction started in the Iapetus Ocean. Um, now, in that paper, this uh, figure was very, very small. Uh, so although we had, let me just check that you can see my pointer, somebody. Can you see where I'm pointed to with the arrows? Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay. So we, we had put recognizable little pictures of terrains in here, but we didn't label them. And so we didn't really follow up on that. So in a way, I feel we sort of dropped the ball in following up on that and producing a more detailed version. Um, uh, so that's at the background of this project too. Um, now, this involves, as you will see, a lot of data. And to keep things even half manageable, uh, we've restricted our attention to the part of the Appalachian caledonite origin that's shown in the big red oval here, um, the northern Appalachians and the British Isles, roughly from New York to the east coast of England and Scotland. Um, and this origin was probably the first origin to have had a plate tech model for its uh, origin. Um, so this is the paper by Tuzo Wilson in 1966, over 50 years ago now, asking did the Atlantic close and then reopen it. And um, Wilson described what has subsequently been come to be termed uh, the Wilson cycle. Um, and he described this Atlantic ocean of uh, lower Paleozoic time, early Paleozoic time, I would say, um, that uh, subsequently was named the Iapetus by Harland and Geyer. And I think it would be fair to say that there's pretty good consensus that the Iapetus Ocean opened as a three-way split, a triple junction, uh, between the continents of Laurentia and Baltica, and what eventually became amalgamated into Gondwana. And there's some uh, questions about the relative timing of this amalgamation versus the split, which we won't go into. Uh, but basically, it was a three-way split between these three components of the supercontinent uh, Rodinia. Now, Wilson talked about the ocean closing and then rifting and reopening. Um, but there's a step in the Wilson cycle that Wilson didn't actually talk about in that 1966 paper, which is the conversion from open ocean opening to ocean closing. Uh, this step marked with a big question mark on the 1972 diagram of the Wilson cycle. And what is commonly supposed is that a passive continental margin 
somehow spontaneously inverts and becomes an active continental mountain. And that's quite a plausible hypothesis because this is, after all, the oldest, densest part of the ocean that has opened between two continents following rifting. Um, so this has a certain uh, plausibility to it. Uh, but when we look at, when we try and use an actualistic approach and find an example of this in the uh, tectonic history of the Earth since the breakup of Pangaea in the last 200 million years, uh, we can find no examples of this happening. Um, so the only um, oceans that formed as a part of the breakup of Pangaea um, that contain subduction zones, those subduction zones have a different origin. They did not form by the inversion of uh, passive continental margins. And here's a, the passive margin that I spent m much of my life on and where I am at the moment on sabbatical leave here at uh, KD University. And we're right next to the oldest piece of the uh, Atlantic Ocean floor and it doesn't show much sign of converting into a subduction zone. Um, so more plausible uh, mechanisms for the origin of subduction in rifted oceans are uh, two. Um, this one, um, proposed by Stern and Bloomer, which is the uh, conversion of a transform fault to a subduction zone. And transform faults are also mechanically plausible places to initiate subduction because there's a big thermal contrast between the two plates on either side of a long transform fault uh, like this one here, which is supposed to have uh, formed the subduction zones that have eventually started to penetrate both into the Pacific but also into the Indian Ocean. Uh, the other process that puts subduction into a widening ocean is this one that goes on in the Caribbean. Um, this is what we used in back in that 19, uh, 2014 paper. And um, uh, subduction in the Atlantic Ocean is occurring here. And most notably here, there are complicated zones of transpression and transtension along the northern and southern margins of the Caribbean plate. Oblique shortening uh, along the Venezuelan margin here. And little ocean basins, oblique, uh, narrow ocean basins like the Cayman Trough opening along the northern part of the Caribbean plate, as well as some uh, some shortening going on in other parts of that boundary. So these are complex boundaries. Um, despite those arguments, most of the models that have been proposed for the Iapetus Ocean and its closure have been based solidly on two-dimensional cross-sections like this, which make it very difficult to portray either of the phenomena that I've just described. And this one, for example, uh, very early, this is probably the earliest, um, uh, more specific cross-section-based model uh, of the Iapetus by uh, Dewey, um, does show a passive margin inverting spontaneously into an active margin here. Uh, and there's a whole history of these diagrams, and I include myself in this rogues gallery of ignoring the a long strike and strike slip component with a diagram I did with the case uh, in uh, 2001. Um, so there are a lot of these diagrams out there. Um, the, the benefits and the dangers are illustrated in these two models by Francis MacDonald, one from a 2014 paper. Um, and this is a really well-argued paper um, that uh, uh, basically proves that a fragment of Gondwana arrived at the Laurentian margin uh, very early, way before anybody had previously thought, uh, at for 75 million years ago or so in the early Ordovician. Um, and it was emplaced onto probably an off-margin microcontinent, uh, here and uh, quite convincing evidence that some of these Paragon Dwanan fragments were in the vicinity of Laurentia um, in the early Ordovician. In the 2017 paper, which I'm not so much in agreement with, um, they extrapolate this history along the margin all the way from southern New England to Newfoundland, uh, suggesting that uh, both the collision of a Gondwanan fragment um, and the uh, subduction, the subsequent flip of the subduction polarity has been roughly synchronous all the way along the margin. And I think that's a dangerous assumption. Uh, there's not much evidence that it occurred in the Newfoundland part of assumption, uh, part of the margin, and I'll be showing evidence. Um, and this is the part of the margin that uh, Shauna White has worked on. And she has shown quite convincingly that the, both the collision and the flip are 
quite strongly diachronous along the margin. Um, so there are dangers in extrapolating along uh, collisional continental margins. And the history of studies of origins is full of people doing great studies on one place and then uh, in one transect and then extrapolating somewhat rashly, I would say, a long strike. Why this is dangerous is illustrated by our best example of a, um, um, a, a arc continent collision, a best, our best analog for the events that went on in the Ordovician on the Laurentian margin. And it's really rather a good analog because the northern margin of Australia is a carbonate margin, has a carbonate platform, um, it's, uh, which was the uh, environment along the Laurentian margin in the Ordovician. And uh, the northern part of the Australian continent has already collided with an arc here, which has emplaced a big slab like ophiolite sheet in Papua New Guinea and an analog for the Bay of Islands ophiolite, if you like, in Newfoundland. And the subduction polarity has flipped there. So subduction is going on under the um, Australian continent. Uh, but here in the, um, as we go further to the west, uh, arc continent collision is still in progress here. And if we go further west still, uh, arc continent collision hasn't even started. This is still a passive margin. Uh, so things are progressing very diachronously along the Australian margin, uh, particularly uh, where there are big zigzags, promontories and re-entrance in, in the Australian margin. And we know that Laurentia had the same prominent prom uh, promontories and re-entrance following the work of Bill Thomas. So here I spin around Australia so that it looks like a wrencher and you can see how good the geometrical analog is. And then if we go uh, maybe 20 million years into the future, um, this is what I would speculate the Australian margin is going to look like. Subduction flip has occurred all the way along the margin. So subduction is going on underneath the Australian margin. And this big mass of fragments in Indonesia and the Philippines, which I've provocatively labeled Gandiria here, is all about to be accreted uh, into the Australian margin or the Laurentian margin. And you will note that this mass of microcontinents here contains its own records of collisions, minor collisions, minor ophiolites, uh, small ocean basins, um, which have been interacting with each other in the history before this gets secreted to the continental margin. So I would suggest this has parallels and accounts for some of the complexity that we see within the uh, Appalachian Caledonite origin. So that complexity is illustrated here, uh, where I've attempted to label all of the different trains that people have identified. And you can see there are a lot of them. Um, and uh, it's hard to keep them all in one's head. And uh, students that I've tried to introduce to this origin, uh, if they have not grown up in it, are very confused by terrains within terrains. And um, one of the things that we will try to do in this paper is to suggest a sort of rationalized terminology um, where we can recognize larger entities that contain some of these smaller terrains to reduce some of the ambiguities uh, I won't go through naming them now, nor will I go through naming all of the lines that have been identified in the origin. And again, there are a lot of these. Most of these lines at one time or another have been identified as the Iapetus suture. Um, and I will try to explain why that's a bit of a mug's game. There probably is not one Iapetus suture. Anyway, there are lots of these boundaries. And there is similarly large and somewhat bewildering, though not as large, number of origen, origenic events that have been named. And I've just listed some of them here. I won't go through them all in detail, but I will use some of these terms uh, later on. And although most of these names were proposed by people who thought they were short-lived collisional events, uh, when you put the whole list together, you will see that there is really no time when orogeny was not happening somewhere along the margin. Of course, that's what we would expect if we look at modern margins like the Australian margin where things are very diachronous. So again, the idea that orogeny is episodic is maybe partially an illusion. Okay, so that's a lot of generalizations. 
Um, one of the things that has come into play in this sort of large scale tectonic analysis has been the ability to do do it yourself plate tectonic reconstructions on the surface of a sphere. And that's through a software called G plates, which is free for anybody to download. Uh, and a number of the people who are doing reconstructions of the major continents, this is one by Matt Demeyer, De um, uh, have used G plates and have published their rotation files in the supplementary data of their papers. So you can download their rotation files and I've down captured uh, Matt Demeyer's here and I've used it to make an animation of the model described in his paper for the evolution of the Iapetus ocean. This is the only published model for the early Paleozoic Iapetus. Um, I've uh, modified, uh, I've added to his uh, download of rotations by just uh, putting the topography that's distributed in the free data bundle for novices that comes with G plates. Obviously, this is not the right topography. This is present day topography. It just this serves as a marker, um, but it does help to uh, locate things. Um, so we'll run that through again. And one thing I want to uh, point out here is that all of these Gondwana derived terrains, which we call Avalonia and Gandiria and so forth, all sit on one plate here in this model until the very last minute uh, when Avalonia and Gandiria are separated here uh, to make things work in the final collision. So this is a sort of Occam's razor minimal complexity model. Um, I'm going to suggest that we can do better, although I don't have a model, a completed model to show for it uh, yet, um, by looking at a number of data sets that I would say are neglected in the analysis of the, um, uh, of the Appalachian caledonide origin. Um, and there are four approaches that I'm going to use. Um, uh, the first is really just the present as a key to the past. Um, we need to look at what has happened. I'm using present loosely to mean everything that happened since the Devonian, which is perhaps a stretch. Um, but at least we need to look at and come to grips with the post Appalachian history before we start restoring things back in time. And that post Appalachian history includes a big record of late Paleozoic strike slip and a big record of Mesozoic stretching. And we should really undo those effects uh, to arrive at a post Akkadian orogeny, maybe a late Devonian endpoint. And then there are three more, uh, which I uh, will introduce legacy biostratigraphic data, magnetic declinations, and then detrital zircon provenance, which involves the largest amount of data. Um, so just to uh, say something briefly about the post Iapetus tectonic history, um, I naively thought going into this that everybody agreed on at least where things were in Pangaea. Um, but there is surprisingly poor agreement on the Pangaea reconstruction. And here I've used G plates to show a number of different reconstructions. And I've, I've held uh, North America fixed in each of these reconstructions. So there's just one outline for North America. And you can see the other parts all occur in multiple different places, according to which author's reconstruction you believe. And because these are published with poles that can be brought into G plates, this is relatively easy to do. So how should we do this? I'm hoping to work with Kim Welford um, to use gravity to try to get a better uh, reconstruction of where the bits and pieces of the Appalachians were. And that means undoing the Mesozoic stretching. And the best handle on the Mesozoic stretching is the gravity. Um, and there are various techniques for converting gravity data into stretching factors, which Kim uh, and her students and collaborators um, have been working on on parts of this margin. Uh, so that's an avenue to getting a, a better Pangaea or a, a, a justifiable Pangaea fit as, a, as an end point for working backwards. For now, I'm going to use this one uh, published by A.D. and Whitaker in 2019. Um, which is based on a proprietary software rather than G plates, uh, but it, um, it it used that same technique, inverting gravity data to measure the amount of stretching. And so the gray outlines are the ones I'm going to use here. 
um, and um, you'll notice that they put uh, Iberia quite a long way further from Newfoundland. Some of these reconstructions, the blue one and the red ones, really don't leave enough room for the Grand Banks in Newfoundland. Um, whereas other reconstructions put uh, the British Isles too far from Newfoundland do not account for the very large stretching that's occurred around Rock Hall uh, and Porcupine Bight and um, Jandok Basin and so forth. So working backwards, we also have a huge record of a carboniferous strike slip, and we published this uh, somewhat speculative paper in 2015 to try to show a possible configuration of restored carboniferous strike slip. Uh, we did that on a, a flat earth by cutting up the map in a drawing program. We started with scissors and pencil and paper actually to start with, uh, but it really should be done as one of the referees pointed out on a surface of a sphere and G plates allows us to do that. So this is the same thing done on the surface of a sphere and that the time is counting backwards here. Again, I'm using the present day topography just as a marker. Um, and this looks like a sinistral motion, but that's because we're going backwards, restoring dextral motion. So we can put the pieces roughly where they at least might have been um, in the uh, middle to late Devonian at the end of the Acadian orogeny. So that's going to be our starting point for working backwards. So I want to say a little bit about biostratigraphy, which in this day, uh, day and age of amazing geochronologic precision um, from isotopic methods uh, is somewhat neglected. Um, uh, there's a legacy of incredibly meticulous uh, biostratigraphic work in the Appalachian Caledonide origin, uh, going back into the last century, and in actually many cases into the century before, um, using fossils like these graptolites um, to minutely subdivide up the stratigraphy. Now, in 1992, when this particular paper was published, we really had no idea when the Eugenian was in terms of millions of years ago. Uh, because the correspondence between the biostratigraphic and the geochronology timescales was really poor. Um, but it's got really very much better since 2000. And this is an excerpt from the 2012 geologic timescale, which we have mostly used, Gradstein et al. Um, and here you can see some of these same fossil zones uh, located on the geologic timescale. Uh, most of these zones, many of these zones are only a million years or so long. And they're plus or minus on this uh, correspondence between the biostratigraphy and the uh, numerical time scale is plus or minus 2 million years or so. And you can see that if you compare this with the 2020 version of the same um, uh, um, publication, um, where I think this is the boundary that has moved the most. Uh, sorry, this one, 467. I think it's now 469. It moved just over 2 million years in the 2020 version. Um, so the precision of biostratigraphy, the precision of this old biostratigraphic record um, is is approaching that of uh, the, the typical um, isotopic ages. Uh, but of course, matching the two requires a lot of work and requires pouring through the biostratigraphic literature. So part of the data compilation that we've done has been to try to do this. So we've made a series of stratigraphic charts like this, um, which locate uh, the isotopic ages on the by on the biostratigraphic timescale effectively. And the uh, little blue lines here are the fossil ages uh, with their implied error bars, which are the length of the zones in this case, part of the error at least. And then the, the plutons isotopic ages are shown in red here uh, with a little pluton symbol and the green diamonds are isotopic ages on volcanic rocks. And then I've added to this diagram uh, with the uh, orange diamonds, those are all detrital, published detrital zircon data sets. And the blue, red and black compass signs are places where people have done paleomagnetic work. Um, so these are, are somewhat complicated stratigraphic charts, but I think they're helpful in relating the biostratigraphic and the isotopic data. Uh, so this is Newfoundland and the British Isles. There are four of these altogether. So paleomagnetism has been used in uh, plate tectonic reconstruction 
uh, w right back to the beginning, actually before plate tectonics. Um, and um, uh, as most of you are, I'm sure, know, uh, paleomagnetism works with magnetization, uh, which we hope was acquired close to the time of formation of a group of rocks. Um, and if the age of acquisition is known, uh, remnant magnetism uh, indicates the ancient location of either the North or the South Pole relative to the rocks as currently found. And there are two parts to paleomagnetic data. The inclination uh, indicates how far you are away from the pole and therefore indicates your latitude. And the declination indicates vertical axis rotations. Uh, so it indicates how much your terrain may be has pivoted on a vertical axis uh, relative to the pole. Uh, paleomagnetism, of course, does not tell you your longitude. And that's one of the frustrations of working with uh, paleomagnetic work. Um, this inspirational road sign is halfway between Edmonton and Calgary on the Highway 2 in Alberta. Uh, thought it illustrates the paleomagnetic conundrum quite well. Um, so most of the um, work that has been done in the Caledonides, and there's been quite a lot of paleomagnetic work done in the Appalachians and Caledonides, uh, has focused on the inclinations and what it tells us about paleo latitude. Uh, so here's an example from work by Case Van Stahl, Sandra Barr and Brenda Murphy, uh, where the inclinations are used to track the um, convergence in latitude between Laurentia and uh, some Gondwana derived fragments um, through the early Paleozoic. Only a very few of the paleomagnetic papers address the declination. Um, the one on the right is one of those exceptions. Most of the paleomagnetic literature kind of dismisses the, um, the rather large declination anomalies that come out of a lot of these, a lot of this work as the result of local fault block rotation. And that's even when the local geological maps show no faults that are plausible places for the major rotations of sometimes more than 90 degrees, which are implied by the declination data. And if you're going to believe the inclinations, you probably should believe and have an explanation for the declinations as well. Um, so I'm, uh, Phil McCausland is working um, uh, with with us on interpreting some of those data. Um, so how big the problem is, is illustrated by this example from 480 million years in the early Ordovician, where there's a paleomagnetic determination uh, in South Wales here, uh, which is a reasonably structurally simple uh, place. You could uh, do things with superimposed folds to maybe explain away some of this declination anomaly, um, but uh, on the face of it implies a major rotation uh, for England and Wales um, in, in the early Ordovician to put it in this upside down configuration on the margin of Gondwana. It turns out that several more early Ordovician and late Cambrian poles uh, from Perigondwanan terrains uh, all have this implication. So it seems likely that there were major rotations of fragments as they crossed uh, the Iapetus Ocean. Okay, so the fourth and largest of these data sets is the detrital zircon data set. And there are over 350 published detrital zircon data sets. That's not zircon grains. Each of these are now, uh, data, data sets contains typically 100 grains or so. Um, so very large number of uh, detrital zircon uh, uh, ages are available. They are published in a variety of formats, uh, done on many different mass spectrometers uh, with different errors, different techniques. Um, and then different assumptions have been made in publishing them, um, different selection of what are the good data, what are the bad data, because you always get some uh, grains that are discordant, for example. And authors have very much differed as to which data they're gonna keep and which ones they're uh, not. Um, so we have made some efforts to standardize these data um, and two areas of difference between different authors are on which isotopic 
pair to use which isotopic ratio so one of the uh, side effects of the different half-lives between the two isotopic systems in plain detrital zircon is that your young grains typically show much greater precision from the 206 238 age and the older grains show much greater precision for the 76 age and so most or most authors have adopted a cutoff where they switch over and we did that um, we used 800 million years because conveniently we didn't have many zircons at that point, so it didn't bother us too much to put a split in the data there. When you're doing statistics with large numbers of data, it's a little uncomfortable to have an arbitrary split like that, which may create a gap or an overlap in your distribution of possible ages that you could come up with. So we've um, redone the selection on all of these data sets by just choosing whichever isotopic ratio has the better stated analytical precision. And that means from about 1500 million years ago to about 800 million years ago, uh, there's a flip-flop. The, uh, the two isotopic ratios are interleaved in the data that we're, uh, we're using. Uh, but we think that's a statistically better way to go. And then the other way in which authors have differed is to, in the ways of calculating discordancy and using a cutoff to get rid of discordant data, which have lost lead or had something else that's happened to them in their history. And we have used a standardized cutoff. Uh, we've calculated discordance simply by the ratio of the 76 age to the 68, 638 age. And we've used a plus or minus 10% discordancy cutoff, which is um, relatively lenient as far as um, the various work goes, although not as lenient as some. Uh, the other thing that is tiresome to do is to figure out where the samples were collected. So please, everybody who's doing detrital zircon data, publish the longitude and latitude of where you collected the sample, because uh, my two students spent an awful lot of time uh, getting uh, little tiny maps out of publications and trying to georeference them in a GIS to get the latitude and longitude of the, um, the data sets. Uh, we've also estimated the depositional age using the closest available biostratic graphic constraints. And I would urge you also, if you're doing detrital zircon work and you are fortunate enough to be working in the Phanerozoic, uh, why not collect at a place where people have found fossils? Uh, because it, uh, you can get into all kinds of arguments. Detrital zircon is a very bad way to determine the depositional age if you have another way to go, either some fossils or a tuff. Um, that can be dated to pin down the depositional age. So those are a couple of takeaways for me and in, in future detrital zircon work. Um, so we've compiled all of these data into an enormous Google Sheets uh, and that, uh, sheet, which is so that we can work on it collaboratively in the group. Several of us can work on it at the same time. Um, and so we have uh, between 350 and 400 uh data sets compiled here and that enables us for example to automatically bin the data into groups um so uh, we're fortunate in their appellations to have some rather distinctive groups the um billion year old zircons that come from the grenville origin um uh we have in blue here um the uh eddie Akron zircons that characterize pan-african what's been called avalonian orogeny um, shown in two shades of red. And then there's an Eburnian population, which we think comes from West Africa, two billion year old, 2.1 billion year old zircons, uh, which are uh, in yellow in this binning process. And the binning is done automatically by a formula in the spreadsheet. Um, so that gives us a pathway to present the data in new and creative ways. Um, we can uh, bin the data uh, and show them as pie charts on a, in a GIS like this. This is QGIS. So we basically just have to extract from that data sheet and pull them into QGIS. And we have a format set up which will plot pie charts of the zircon data. And it, it kind of graphically shows as you go across the Appalachian, the predominance of Granville ages in the West here in the Adirondacks, uh, mixtures in the middle. And you see these African derived, we think, ages and the Pan-African reds uh, coming in in the southeastern part of the origin. So you can start to see patterns emerging. Uh, this is the more traditional way to uh, plot the data um, with uh, kernel density estimate plots at the bottom, uh, which are certainly easy to visualize and a good way of comparing peaks on, uh, on 
separate samples. And then another good way is the cumulative distribution shown at the top, um, which have some uh, uh, rather arcane statistical reasons why they're better. Um, and also uh, it enables you to pack more data on a single diagram. So that's a practical consideration. Um, uh, we've tried doing some new things, uh, uh, plotting triangular diagrams here. So we've taken a group of those bins, which we think are characteristic of different sources, and used them to potentially uh, group the data according to whether they show a predominance of Grenville sources or maybe African sources. Or this green, which we call Anne for Nuna, uh, we think are sources that are abundant both in Laurentia and in Amazonia. Um, so, um, so uh, no immediate answers as to which continent they came from, but it certainly helps in terms of presentation. So with those tools at hand and in the time remaining, I'm going to go uh, sort of step by step backwards from 370, showing a few things that we think we can say as a result of pulling all of these data together. Um, so I'm going to start with the Akkadian events of the very latest Silurian and the early to middle Devonian. I'm going to start in Scotland here, where there's an enormous and very famous fault called the Great Glen Fault. Uh, it's occupied by Loch Ness, famous for its monster. Um, and it's a, a big geological boundary. Um, to the northwest, uh, when we look at the earlier history, it was certainly active in the Devonian and later on in the Carboniferous. To the northwest, when we look at the earlier history, there's a record of Silurian deformation and metamorphism around uh, 330 million years in the Scandian event, which resembles parts of um, Scandinavia. Um, but there's no significant record of Ordovician deformation. Whereas to the southeast, I notice a typo I meant to fix. It says southwest here, it should say southeast. In the Grampian terrain, shown in the stripes here, there's a major Ordovician event, which is effectively the same as the Draconian event in the Appalachians, but it's called Grampian. Um, and no uh, record of Scandian deformation except up in the Shetland Islands, up in the uh, extreme northeast. Uh, so that led Dewey and Strachan to suggest that Loch Ness conceals, conceals a monster size uh, sinistral fault. Um, and uh, they did some ballpark calculations and postulated 900 to 1200 kilometers of sinistral motion. Now that causes a few problems, which they uh, highlighted in their paper. It puts the Grampian Highlands almost in Newfoundland when you look at our Pangaea reconstruction. That's where the Pangaea reconstruction becomes important. Uh, and there's also a little bit of an incompatibility with the traditional interpretation of the paleomagnetism. Um, we have some uh, possible solutions for that. And one of those is made available by the work of Bob Holsworth and more recently by Don Kellett, um, working in the Gander terrain of Newfoundland, which shows very strong evidence for Acadian sinistral transpression. And so we can effectively appeal to that to move parts of Newfoundland out of the way in the Acadian uh, so that they do not overlap with Western Ireland. Uh, and then the other thing is that the correction of inclination flattening in the sedimentary rocks, which was not appreciated uh, in the last century, helps to remove the to move the paleomagnetic magnetic sites a bit closer to the South Pole, and that helps with this aspect of the reconstruction too. Um, so we would identify a portion of the origin which has been translated strike slip wise in the British Isles, but with increasing amounts of sinistral transpression as you go further south in the Appalachians. And we would appeal to that to explain the southward increasing effect of the Acadian orogeny. Um, uh, there's a little bit of an issue with the Acadian orogeny and that the metamorphosed rocks uh, north of this line um, include a Silurian arc, the Mascarene coastal complex in Newfoundland, um, which appears to be on the upper plate of the uh, Silurian subduction zone. And somehow it finds itself buried under thrush sheets in the Acadian. So there must have been some kind of flip or maybe a New Zealand type divergent situation going on in the Acadian to do that. Um, 
so that so uh, that's the the sort of insights we we would say these this compilation provides for the Akkadian event. This line doesn't really have a name. I'm calling it the Akkadian line at the moment. There was a defunct bus company in Atlantic Canada called the Akkadian line. So there's a picture of a bus. That's why there's a picture of a bus. G going back a little further, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, there's a record of Silurian accretion, which is very well documented in the southern uplands of Scotland. I would say we've documented it quite effectively with the work of Robert Dockin in uh, the Fredericton Trough here, um, uh, whereby slices of turbidites were accreted at a trench which must have lain somewhere along this uh, yellow line here, which would have been a Selenian boundary of the Laurentian continent. Uh, and that boundary is stitched by 423 million year olds uh, intrusions. Uh, to the south of this, a range of uh, uh, terrains attributed to Gandiria arrived at the Laurentian margin, uh, well dated by the arrival of Grenville zircons in the overlying um, uh, strata. I'll just illustrate that quickly here. I need to go fast. Uh, in the uh, this is the southern uplands of Scotland, which is uh, full of uh, uh, Laurentian zircon, Grenville zircon. These distributions all look the same through the late Ordovician and the early parts of the Silurian. If we go south of the Solway line, we find that the same age distu uh, distributions are devoid of Laurentian zircon. Um, until the Wenlock, um, about 435 million years, when in comes the Granville-derived um, Coniston and Tranos groups uh, come in with a bang then. So all of the earlier distributions are thoroughly Gondwana-looking. So this pins down the arrival of the Lake District at the Laurentian margin. So by doing this, we think we can show that bits of Gondwana-derived material arrived in a succession of stages through the Ordovician and Silurian, and that there was not one single Iapetus suture, but a multitude of boundaries. This is the boundary that I prefer to call the Mequijit line, that's the Mi'kmaq name for the Beothic of Newfoundland, uh, which represents uh, the margin of Laurentia as it existed at the Ordovician Silurian boundary. This is a time when the Miramichi terrain was undergoing blue schist metamorphism, as um, case is shown here. Um, and this boundary uh, in um, Newfoundland is a boundary between Gondwana derived and Laurentian derived material. Uh, but in the British Isles, it's just Laurentian on both sides of this boundary. Uh, and in southern New England, it's Gondwanan on both sides of this boundary because the arrival of the first Gondwana derived terrain was so diachronous. Now, in the middle Ordovician, we have a lot of paleomagnetic data, and I've put it on G plates here. Uh, we can't quite get everything onto the pole as it should be, uh, but we can come close. Uh, the problematic data are from Bilf here in the Welsh borders, where there are two very close determinations which are mutually contradictory. At least one of them must be wrong. For now, I split the difference. Phil may be able to add extra information on uh, whether to believe either of them. Um, for the rest of them, by moving terrains into appropriate positions, we managed to put them all onto the South Pole here. Um, some of these Gondwana derived terrains have to be very close to Laurentia at this point. Uh, some of them have to be very far to the South. Uh, we can also add to G plates because G plates can bring in shape files, which can carry with them detrital zircon data. We can add to G plates the detrital zircon data sets that fall within five million years of this time at 460. So they're all of the ones we think are uh, Laurentia derived. Here in green are the Nuna derived ones, which could come from South America or from uh, Laurentia. And here are the uh, Gondwana derived ones. And uh, even more neatly, what we can do is we can export those. Um, G plates isn't very good at showing pie charts and things like that, uh, but we can export them in their um, transformed locations back into shape files that we can then import into G plates, uh, sorry, into QGIS. And so we can show those pie charts where they should have been in the middle Ordovician and test our hypothesis for where these terrains are, uh, because obviously we don't expect to see 
uh, Laurentia derived zircon, the blue, arriving in these terrains which had not arrived at the Laurentian margin yet. Uh, so we're we're doing okay here with this reconstruction, but some refinements probably still needed. Uh, I'm going to go very fast through the earlier steps here. Uh, late Ordovician accretion brought in the Popologan uh, and uh, Bronson Hill arcs here to the margin, um, and then. Uh, going back still further, early Ordovician accretion uh, brought in the Moortown terrain here in the south, but everywhere further to the north, uh, the Ordovician Taconian, early to middle Ordovician Taconian events were, uh, we think, purely arc continent collision. This was largely oceanic arcs coming in and some peri Laurentian microcontinent fragments uh, colliding with the margin. So the nature of this boundary, although its timing is about synchronous all along the margin, the nature of this earliest deformation event uh, varies depending on whether Gondwana-derived fragments are available or not. So um, uh, that uh, leaves us with arguing about where did all of these Gondwana derived fragments come from. Uh, so this is our early Ordovician reconstruction. Uh, this is about the time of the Penobscotian or Monian deformation, which we would argue is going on in sinistral transpression along the Gondwanan margin. And that means that some of these terrains probably have homes further east, if you like, along the Gondwanan margin in this space between um, uh, North Africa and Baltica. And in fact, it has been suggested that uh, parts of Avalonia have Baltican affinities. So bringing them out of this zone of uh, rifting between these two continents is not an unreasonable thing to do. Um, so the final step would be to restore these Gondwana derived terrains uh, to their original locations. Um, so this is, is a, a very tentative animated version, which will flash by while I uh, go through some conclusions. Peri-Gondwana uh, peri terrains, or Gondwana-derived terrains, if you like, arrived at the Laurentian margin in many different events from the early Ordovician to the early Devonian. And the domains that refer to as Gandiria, Avalonia probably too, certainly existed as domains on the Gondwanan margin, uh, but may have crossed the Iapetus Ocean uh, in at least five different terrain assemblages. Um, parts of Gandiria carry that record of Penobscotian Ammonian deformation, which was probably acquired on the margin of Gondwana in the early Ordovician. And uh, portions of Gandiria may have traveled attached to portions of Avalonia uh, before they arrived at the Laurentian margin. Um, those possibilities could include the Brookville and Bredore terrains in um, in Atlantic Canada, maybe the Leinster Lakesman terrain in the British Isles uh, became attached to its, their respective parts of Avalonia um, uh, well before they arrived at the Laurentian margin. So an overall take home is that there is no single Iapetus suture. Uh, so it's going to run again while I put up the acknowledgements. Um, uh, I won't go through everybody in detail except to highlight again the contributions of Daniels Kononoffs and Jordan Cope. Um, uh, folks at the University of Alberta, um, Andy Dufresne, who did uh, work with our detrital zircon determinations, and graduate students who worked with detrital zircon, and thank them for discussions and contributions along the way. Case Van Stahl, Randa Murphy, Chris White, uh, other folks that I've probably forgotten, and apologies uh, for discussions at various times after many talks like this one, and of course the CTG for uh, letting me show you all this stuff. So that's it. Thank you very much.